Hello, everyone. Thank you for settling down. Welcome. This is the Inside the War Room panel. I'm, my name is Brad Genzer. I'm a second year graduate student at MIT. I'm the student organizer for this panel. Before I hand it over to our moderator, Mike Reese of ESPN, uh, I'd like to make a few administrative announcements. Hopefully by now you figured out the Q&A system, which we will allow for. So if you want to ask questions, we're going to be doing it electronically. And the way you do it is you can text or tweet. If you're going to text, please text to the number 22333. You're going to text the code word for this panel, which is War Room, W-A-R-R-O-O-M. And then you're going to follow with your question. If you're tweeting, you're going to tweet that same thing to at poll, P-O-L-L. So with that, uh, we have a great panel for you, and I'll hand it over to Mike. Mike? Thanks, Brad, and uh, thanks for all your preparation leading into the panel. Uh, you did a great job, and here with Thomas Dimitrov, a two-time Sporting News Executive of the Year, Mike Smith, head coach of the Falcons since 2008, three-time NFL Coach of the Year, uh, regular season record that these two have put together, 60 and 36, four playoff appearances, and we're talking about alignment between the front office to the field, and I can't think of two better people to talk about this. So I want to go right back to the start. When you guys came together, 2008, Thomas, you're hired as general manager after being director of college scouting for the Patriots. You decide Mike is the right coach for the Falcons. How much did you use analytics uh, in coming to that decision? Uh, great, great question. The first question I have, however, is how Smitty was able to be three-time coach of the year and I was only two-time yeah. executive of the year. Media. Right? Still trying to figure that out. Yeah. Only from a negotiation standpoint. Point. Okay, Mr. <laughs> DePiciato. Look, uh, we've talked a lot about this. We, we are in a really comfortable situation as far as the relationship between myself and, and Mike Smith. And, and when we kicked off this journey back in 2008 in Atlanta, you know, our goal was to bring, bring together a group of individuals and football people who had a really good, strong understanding of the game, which Mike does, understood the importance of enjoying the journey as well, which I think most of us understand in today's world. It's not about, you know, uh, drudgery. It's about making sure that if you can have, you know, enjoy the journey, have fun while working very, very hard, that, you know, you have a, a fighting chance to be successful. We all know in this league, and I think most who follow sport, you know, how imperative it is to have a really good working relationship at the top between a general manager and a head coach. Mike fit the bill. As counterintuitive as it is that most of us would think you have to just, you, you have to go after the most uh, uh, incredibly wildly, highly educated individual from MIT or Harvard. It's, it's not always that way. It's, it's about the people side of it as well and, and about the relationship and being able to be communicative day in and day out, sometimes even five to ten times a day. That was very important for me in the quest to find a coach, you know, like Mike is, to make sure that we were going to be on the same wavelength at so many, so many levels. From an analytics standpoint, interestingly enough, there's no question. I don't even know if Mike knows exactly what we did as far as analyzing Mike from a statistical side. Mike just thought he was a nice guy with a great understanding of football. There were a lot of other things uh, under the covers, so to speak. As far as our analysis of Mike as a defensive coordinator over all of his years, um, as a linebacker coach as well, determining where he was from a statistical standpoint and his teams were producing sacks, uh, tackles, where they ranked as far as defense over the years. That was very important for us, for us to, in the end, just like we do with players, juxtapose Mike Smith with the five or six other coaches that we were interviewing. Had a lot to do with the statistical side on top of, obviously, the personal side uh, that, that Mike was so, uh, fit the bill so, so well. Mike, what, what do you remember about that process? Well, I, I remember uh, it being a very long process. Uh, in terms of uh, going through and, for me, analyzing what the Atlanta Falcons needed to get back to the type of football that needed to be played. Uh, and I think when Thomas and I first hit, what I remember is Thomas and I had never really even met each other prior to the interview. Uh, that doesn't happen very often in the, uh, in the National Football League because guys work with one another. But I had never even really had a conversation and I can remember sitting down with Thomas, Mr. Blank, 
at his office and said, you guys got an hour. Well, he, Mr. Blank stuck his head back in at, at about an hour and five minutes, like, hey, are you going to break this meeting up? And uh, we said, well, we need a few more minutes. And it ended up going about two and a half hours. Uh, and we, f we had a connection on a lot of levels about what it takes to build a football team. And believe it or not, uh, analytics are a big part of it because you have to analyze what the team had done in the previous seasons, what the team had done the previous years, what Thomas's background was, my background was, and we came together in that, in that meeting, that first meeting, and we, I left out of there going, wow, that went well because we see the game of football and we see running a football team the same way. Uh, and it was very good communication, but it was more about, in my mind, it was more about collaboration. Uh, we could talk on, on, about so many different things. And uh, when you have a collaborative atmosphere uh, starting off and you're able to keep that going, I think you're going to enhance your chances for being successful. Not only did Mike come to the table with a, a lot, you know, a great book, a great presentation, and, and definitely from a statistical standpoint, everything that you offered to us and me as we were analyzing. He was very good and he did his research. He, he, had, he knew my Grateful Dead bent. He knew my <laughs> snowboarding and mountain biking. So he, he was able to kind of, I think one of the other things I think he did is he did a really good job with knowing our, our organization. And I, I say that tongue in cheek, obviously, but Mike is such a people person. He understands how important it is to bond with the people in our building, not only myself, but the rest of the organization. Mike, you, you mentioned that you guys actually had never really met before the interview. I, I want to talk about once you did sort of come together as a group, uh, how often do you meet on a regular basis when we talk about this alignment between the front office and the field? Well, from the very beginning, it was daily. Uh, you know, Thomas and I were coming into an organization that had been in place. Uh, so we were the new guys. Uh, and it was, it was difficult uh, in, in some instances because we were learning at the same time, not only about our football team, but we were learning about the organization. So in the beginning, we met every day. Sometimes started the day to see how the day was gonna start and end the day. Now our families weren't there, so it was a lot easier to, to do that. Uh, and I think as we've grown, we don't meet as much, but we don't go a day probably without having a conversation. And it's on a lot of levels. It's not just about the football team, it's about the organization. Thomas's position is, is such that he's running the whole football operations, not just the football team. So, you know, interesting point as well. We, we meet very regularly and on the field during the season. So in season, different meetings, different discussions, different points of focus. Mike's point of focus obviously is coaching the football team and being what we like to call the CEO of our football team. Now, I think that we spend a lot of time during the in-season, but you know, overall, the time that we spend in the off-season is more because we travel around a lot. We are really, really involved as a, as a GM head coaching tandem as far as building our roster. So after the, um, after the Senior Bowl and the Combine and then now going out into the spring to visit all of these different schools where we may be interested in certain prospects at X, Y, and Z, uh, university across the country, we're traveling, we're together a lot. So I think we're together a lot more now this part of the season than we really are during the season. I always assume that I could sit back, here you go, Smitty, here are all your players, this is exactly what you need, and kick my feet up and be able to relax, but somehow that doesn't always happen. Yeah, it's not that easy, Thomas, as you know, with, uh, with, I injury, it was. with injuries and okay. such. But, uh, okay. you know, when you talk about the the off season, I, I have a different term for it, uh, and people that follow the NFL know it. It's just a non-game playing season, Mike. We're just not playing games. We're still working. In fact, sometimes I feel like we work harder in the off season than we do in the in, in the season because we're going through the process of recalibrating our roster, and it happens every year. Whether your record is 13 or three, or whether your record's 12 and four, the way that the NFL is designed with uh, regards to the salary cap you're going to be recalibrating your roster every off season. And that's the most important thing is you've got to analyze where your team is and where it's going to be in a year from now. And that's what I think Thomas and his staff do such a great job. As a coach, I live week to week. As a general manager, 
he's got a much further, uh, longer timeline than I have. I'm all about the next game. Thomas is about the next season. And he always is, it's a good checks and balance because there'll be times that I'll be wanting to go, hey, Thomas, we got to do this. You know, we got to come in and make this. We got to talk about this. We got to get this guy, that guy. Take a deep breath. His timeline is much, is, is much different. And I think that's kind of a, a good way that we work together, that we have different timelines. We're, and I definitely want to get into that more, you know, specific to analytics in a little bit. But I did want to ask you, this is a sort of partnership, general manager, coach. Anything you can compare it to, you know, in, uh, in sort of real life, if you will? I, I mean, not specifically. I think it, it's common at, you know, at any level from a corporate standpoint, at the, from a business perspective. It is so important to have that partnership at the top working together in a, you know, sort of a... Um, an easy flowing type of way and being able to communicate. Believe me, we have our discussions, we have our disagreements like anyone would, but it is so important to make sure we, we live by this sort of basic pyramidal decision making model. It's, it's, we have a lot of really important people involved in the process, as Smitty mentioned, very collaborative. Um, we at so many levels with coaches involved, with our scout and our personnel department involved. But as, it, as we move towards the top, towards the decision at the very top, it's going to be myself and Smitty at the top making the decisions. There are some incredible people. We just, we just added recently, we added some new coaches, a new offensive line coach, a new D-line coach. We, we, we added someone that you in New England would know very well and Scott Pioli as, as our assistant general manager who were you know, wildly excited about because of what Scott can come to the table with as far as insight, not only from personnel and a team building standpoint, policy standpoint, financial standpoint. So we've really, we really talk about how important it is to have all the people around us to help us make the decision at the top of that pyramid. But in the end, that relationship has to be, uh, it has to be synonymous, uh, excuse me, it has to be, what am I trying to say? It has to be working, it has to be smooth flowing in so many ways. Many, many times over the years, we've seen GM and head coach who are great football men, but in the end, they weren't together on their approach and, and things fell by the wayside. Do you think of anything on that, Mike? Yeah, I, I, I agree with Thomas in, in terms of that we want to have as many people involved in, in the decision. And analytics are very important. Uh, you know, we analyze everything that we do prior to making a decision and post. But it is, it is part of the decision-making process, and it's a big part uh, with, with the Atlanta Falcons. But ultimately, as we get closer to the decision, more and more people do fall out of the, uh, do fall out of the decision-making process. So I just wanted to start by everyone getting a feel on how these two guys work together, because I think that's really the foundation of what this panel is, this sort of building alignment between the front office uh, and the field. So now I sort of want to dig in to how you actually did that when you got there in 2008. So, uh, Thomas, I'll just start with you. I mean, what, what were the biggest challenges that you had as you started this process of trying to get everything aligned in this Falcons organization? Again, I think everyone has to understand that you're talking about, you know, general manager and management and head coach. It's not always easy to be on the same wavelength, so to speak. There are different agendas. Hopefully the agenda is right, and that was one of the things in the process of hiring Mike, in the, in the process, process of discussing what Mike was about and what our philosophies were about, it was very important, again, that we were, that we were um, our approach was, was very similar because there's no way that we would have been able to approach something that was coming off of really a treacherous season in, in 2007. So Mike and I talked about it from day one, about the importance of, of building a team that, you know, full, as you know, Mike, positive, passionate, and persevering people. Um, you know, people that were going to come in and, and put their, their, um, themselves on the line to accomplish what we needed to accomplish, not only, not, only from a, not only from a player standpoint, but definitely from a young and a coaching standpoint and a personnel department standpoint. It was very important for us to approach it in that way so that everyone understood that we were, we were traveling in the same direction. Yeah, and I think in two, when we started in 2008, one of the things that I did in uh, investigating, putting together coaching staff is I tried to analyze what other staffs were and how they were put together. And I really came away with some interesting takeaways just on a simple analyzation of 
how staffs were put together. And I think we did it a little bit different in, uh, uh, in Atlanta in terms of, of the backgrounds of the coaches. And they were for specific reasons because I really believe that you have to have a cross-section of, of coaches that are interacting with the players on the field day to day. So we had college, former college coaches, former players that played in the NFL. And then I wanted to have coaches that had head coaching experience as well because it was my first head coaching job. I wanted to have three or four guys that had sat in that position that I was sitting in and I could go to them when there was something that would come up because they've analyzed and gone through and looked at, looked at why they're not head coaches anymore and you can learn from uh, the people that you surround yourself with. There's actually a great example of that just currently the, the San Diego Chargers where Mike McCoy was talking about why he hired Ken Wisenhunt as his offensive coordinator because Wisenhunt had done it in Arizona, same exact thing that, yeah. that he had said. So um, people might forget 2007, when you guys weren't with the Falcons, was probably the, the toughest year that a franchise can have. Uh, the head coach had actually walked out on the team. The Falcons finished with four wins that year, and general morale in the building was probably at an all-time low, not to put words in owner uh, Arthur Blank's mouth. But Mike, I want to ask you, you know, as you sort of got in there and started to put things together, what did you do to try to change the course of that? Well, I think you have to change the culture uh, of, of the building first. And really, the support staff was probably the first thing that we had to, uh, had to address. We wanted everybody to know, hey, the guys, that, the guys that do our film breakdown, the video guys, the guys that work in our computer uh, IT department, uh, we wanted them to all know that they were going to be an integral part of, of the success that we were going to have in the, in the future. And then you switched gears to talk about your roster. And it gets very in, de very in depth when you start talking about your roster. And I'll, I know Thomas will have a whole lot more to say about it, but you've got to first look at your roster, not only on the ability of the players, but there are so many other factors that you have to uh, analyze. One being how we're gonna put this together to fit under sal the, the salary cap. So that was how I approached it. The support staff first, and then we moved into evaluating our roster and looking at what they bring to the table and what they would do for us as we were going to change how we did business moving forward. I want to ask you specifically <laughs> about how you evaluated the roster with analytics, but before I do, correct me if I'm wrong, as part of sort of reaching out to the staff and getting everyone on board, printing out headshots of everyone in the organization and sort of making an effort to go around and meet them. Is that something that I believe you did and, and explain yeah. that and, and how that was part of that process? Well, I probably spent the better part of the first week going around and introducing myself, Thomas, Thomas doing the same thing to everybody in the building. There's over 150 employees, so it took the better part of the week. And it wasn't just a fly by high you know, we wanted, we wanted everybody to understand the importance of their job and that they were going to be helping us be successful. So it gives you an opportunity to break the ice and also lets people know how your management style is in terms of how you are going to be interactive. So that's the human side of it. And you marry that up with the analytical side. You get in, you evaluate your roster. Thomas, explain how you did that when you, t when, you, when you got in there and you're saying this is what we have and how did you use analytics in sort of evaluating your roster? Well, first, just from a human standpoint to lead into the analytics, I mean, we were an organization that was just in, in disarray and everyone in that organization when we got there was looking for serious direction. They, unfortunately, and, and not to be... Um, uh, not to be negative about the people that were there before, but I mean, this was a situation that, that was just craving direction, positive direction, and Smitty did a heck of a job trying to pull, in his attempt to pull everyone, everything together from a support staff standpoint. That was very important for us. Now flip it over to the roster and flip it over to a lot of discussions that Smitty and I had. A, from a standpoint of the type of talent that the players were on the field, how they moved around, their, their pure skills on the field. Compare that to where we were in free agency, what was available in free agency during that time in 2008, and what was going to be available in the draft as well. And as well as from, a, from an analytics standpoint, and then compare where we were contractually 
not only with our team, but where, where we were, our comparative, uh, comparatives to other teams and p by position. That was a big thing for us, looking at our positions and comparing our contracts to the rest of the contracts in the league to see exactly you know, how we stood from a, you know, from a salary cap standpoint, but also from a value standpoint. And that's, that's a huge thing in today's NFL, and we'll continue to talk more about that. But for us, you can imagine Neophyte general manager and head coach coming in, trying to decide the direction of the team, not only in the building, but from the standpoint of putting together the right roster, there were a lot of things involved. There were a lot of uh, statistical analysis and approaches involved with um, you know, some of the very important people in our building who were some very intelligent people, much more intelligent than uh, myself. I won't speak for you, Smitty, but... No, they're a lot smarter but, than uh, me, I you know, can assure you. Much more intelligent that way that could provide us with some very sound um, background on you know, our decisions and help us make the decisions on who we jettisoned from our roster and who we decided we'd stay with and who we might decide to, to restructure. So, so just to follow up on that, Thomas, it sounds like the analytics are a big part of the economics. They're almost weaved together. You take the football side, the mm -hmm. economics, and, and that's a big part of these analytics that we're talking about. The economics and, and analytics are huge for us. Again, uh, you know, when you're talking about what's going to be potentially 130 million plus uh, you know, dollar cap, you have to be very smart about how you're utilizing, you know, utilizing your resources. We signed Matt Ryan last year to a $104 million contract. A whole other topic of conversation, but you can imagine, you have to be that much more creative with how you're going to lay out your roster. When five players on your team are making as much money as most teams are making right now, when you think about it, there's Matt Ryan making the money that he's making, and, you know, Hopefully, knock on wood, Julio Jones heals up, which he's going to. He's gonna, you, you're looking at two individuals on a team making over a quarter of your cap. That's, that's, that's tough to look at that. It's great, two amazing football players. However, it's up to us to be very creative by using analytics and trying to decide where we're going to you know, divvy up our money. There is, a, there is a, a disintegration, so to speak, of the middle class. And go figure that the middle class is five or six million dollars, but... That is, it's, 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 it's easing up, so to speak, and we're going to have to spend a lot more time developing our football players, which is another very important topic of conversation, you, youthful development. You, you touched on this before, Mike. You're sort of in that head coaching seat where it's the short-term focus. It's that opponent that week. It's, I, you know, I got to get better, uh, get the team better for this game. Thomas is that big picture seat, you know, the, the general manager building the team with the long-term vision in mind. How do you as the head coach sort of stay disciplined in sort of balancing uh, those two sort of um, viewpoints? Well, I think I have a very good understanding of it simply because Thomas has been able to educate me along with his staff in terms of how contracts are, are put together and how you have to project what's going to happen two or three years uh, down the road. So it gives me a sense of understanding it. Now the toughest job is then going to my assistant coaches who probably are even more narrow-minded in terms of their, their timeline and explain that we can't get player A, B, and C here. If we get player A, B, and C here, we're going to have to get rid of player F, H, and X. And uh, those, you know, those are the trade-offs and it's a changing dynamic. Uh, uh, you know, our, our salary cap guy just does so many different things in terms of creating these reports, especially when, for example, in the period we're in right now, that Thomas and the, his staff are going through with free agency, projecting and trying to plug in numbers and trying to do the accounting behind that, it just, it, it just blows me away that those guys are smart enough to try to figure, you know, to figure this out. If we structure this we structure it this way. We have the ability to maybe add three players instead of two. And we're not talking about adding three players, that, you know, specifically this year. But that is something that uh, helps me, and I get educated on it, and it makes me have a better understanding of the long term instead of getting out of this routine of I got to have this guy, this guy, this guy. Because you're hearing it from your coaching staff. You're hearing it from the fans, the media. They all have, you know, they, everyone has uh, the answer, and you've got to be very disciplined and structured in how you're going to put it together, but also have to have the ability to be able to make adjustments to what 
those reports uh, pre present to you? Sort of along those lines, Thomas, you have to make a decision. I'm going to you know, go, go, go to the draft to fill this need, or you know what, I'm going to go to free agency to fill that need. Uh, how do you sort of determine which way is the best way to go? Well, to Smitty's point, I mean, Mike, by the way, is one of the best in the league, as, in my mind, as far as having an understanding of long term. It's not easy to do that as a head coach. Um, you know, Mike's, never once has Mike come down to my office and slammed his fist on the desk like you see in the movies with a head coach saying, you know, he wants, you know, this player and he has to have him and if, if he doesn't have him, the, the world's going to blow up, whatever that, that, that analogy is. Mike's very mindful of that and that's important. That comes back to how important our relationship is and how we continue to build and trust each other. I know when Mike comes down to ask about a certain player, I know that he means it. I know that it's very important for him and his team um, as far as the development of the team. So that's very important. From a long-term standpoint, we as general managers obviously always want to build through the draft. That's ideally, it's the best value. It gives us an opportunity to grow with the player. And um, hopefully by the time that their, you know, their second contract comes around, we know exactly what they are. They've developed into our system. They, they, have, they possess the requisite traits off the field and it's smooth sailing and we all look good by acquiring the right people. Now we also know how important it is to have that, that talent that is accomplished and it, you know, the, the players that have been in this league and understand what it takes to be champions, the young guys don't necessarily know that. Coaches often will gravitate towards the veterans. We all know that is comfortable for them. Um, and, and, and yet we all know, back to my earlier point, we can't have our roster littered with a whole bunch of veteran talent. There's no way financially that we can do that. So it's important to have the long-term view from the draft building standpoint, but also be very mindful of the here and now because we all know, everyone's heard the line, the not for long NFL um, um, statement. There's no question that Arthur Blank, he's a fantastic owner and yet he wants to win now. We know that. Last year we were 13 and three. This past year we were you know, four and 12, it's tough. The patience for our for ownership in this league is, you know, it 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 wears thin, you know, through a season like that. So we have to be mindful of you know, sort of marrying those two elements, draft and free agency, and a lot of it does come down to analyzing what the players, you know, what the players really are from the standpoint of draft, the youthful guys to to the veterans, and how are the veterans truly producing at this point in their career. So there, again, analytics abound as far as our analysis of do we go after this defensive end in the draft and wait for him to develop over the next two, three, four years? Or do we jump right in, spend big money, big money I'm talking about for a defensive end, and hopefully he impacts right away? You know, that's going to be very important for us. Well, probably some would say maybe the most important decision that you guys made as you sort of started this in 2008 with the Falcons was your first draft pick. Uh, quarterback Matt Ryan out of Boston College was the third overall pick, and I sort of want to dive into that process specific to how you used any type of analytics, Thomas, okay. to make that decision. Well, well, first of all, back to the human side, I mean, we, we analyzed Matt up and down many, many ways from a character standpoint, from a skill standpoint, which is not necessarily the scope of this conversation. This obviously isn't a scouting meeting, but that is you know, hugely important for us to make sure that he possessed the traits, you know, had the very good opportunity to be around New England and see what a all-pro Hall of Fame, first ballot Hall of Fame quarterback would be in, in Tom Brady. So we worked a lot on that. On the, on the analytical and statistical study side, we did a lot of work on Matt from biomechanical assessment and how he compared to what we thought other quarterbacks compared to, to um, you know, the statistical analysis of, of Matt's you know, history in, in, you know, in the collegiate ranks, to a big part for me was analyzing you know, over the years how the draft played out. There was, there was so much discussion and banter about how if you pick a quarterback in the first round, the probability of that quarterback failing you know, was astronomical. And in the end, we paid attention to all of that and we were very mindful of it. But I think it comes down to what we've said all along and what's been you know, said in this conference over the years. We take the analytics, we take the statistical analysis and we, we hone in on it. But in the end, someone has to make the decision and the human element has to, you know, has to you know, weigh in. And for us, we were very mindful of it. 
Um, but in the end, we thought Matt Ryan was the guy to go with, and, and we still believe, believe definitely, $104 million, we better believe, um, that he is the guy to uh, take us to where we need to be to be the elite football team in this league. And, and you know me, Thomas, I, I hold myself accountable. We can go back to a conversation that we had before that draft, and I said, I think I'd take the defensive lineman, Glenn Dorsey. <laughs> and uh, that's the beauty of being a media member versus a general manager. If he actually did that, he might not be here today. I don't lose my job for making those yeah. decisions, but I do hold myself Good. accountable. So, my, you know, the same, same question, Mike. I mean, Matt Ryan, um, you going through that process, what was important yes, to you? Uh, to, to add to what Thomas was saying uh, in terms of, of our evaluation, we look at the stats, you know, and so many times the stats can lead you to where you, where you need to go. Uh, you know, Matt was a guy that threw almost 650 passes as a senior. There were people that wouldn't, as we go through the draft process, there's so many outside factors that you have to take in because there's so much noise and talk, and that's the great thing about the National Football League. But I can remember people talking about, well, he threw 19 interceptions as a, you know, as as a sen as a senior at uh, at Boston College. Uh, so you got to you've got to go in now as a coach and anal analyze that. You've got to watch all 648 or 600 close to 650 passes that he threw, and now take it another step and look at it and try to say, all right, well, that interception, was that on the quarterback? Was that on the receiver? Was that on the, off, uh, on the offensive line? Uh, and I had an interesting conversation last night in the, in the, in the uh, VIP. VIP meeting, meeting uh, last night uh, about people, they're going so far in their, in their ability to analyze, analyzing offensive linemen that uh, it, they take it that, you know, they take it that deep like a coach has been doing like we did when we were analyzing Matt Ryan. And no disrespect for the wide receivers that Matt Ryan was throwing to at Boston College, but we, our evaluation of watching all 600, nearly 650 throws was that Matt didn't have 19 interceptions. There were just a handful of throws that we would all like to have back. And those, I think, are very... Uh, important things that you look at and as a coach I'll say this from from an analytic standpoint the numbers start and what they do is they get you thinking and they get you evaluating and that's the thing that uh, excites me about looking at numbers and from from way back uh, from when I was a defensive assistant uh, you, those numbers allow you and direct you in a in the direction that you need to go to get more information. It's not the end all be all in my mind, but it is the, a very integral part of any decision that you make. And you can basically put a number to anything um, in, in terms of analyzing, especially in athletics. It's just so interesting to me because the number 19 interceptions for Matt Ryan was all we heard, you know, leading into that draft. And you guys were picking third, and there was a, at least one team before you that you could say needed a quarterback, and they saw the numbers maybe differently, or there was something about it that they didn't feel as comfortable with uh, that you guys did. Now, speaking of difference of opinion, uh, Julio Jones was another player you guys drafted, and in this case, you traded up to get him. Thomas, I'll direct this to you. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a, a trade in 2011 uh, for a receiver that you moved pretty far up the draft board, and that there was some criticism uh, at the time of that move Turned out pretty well for you, uh, very well, I would say. Mm -hmm. But what were the analytics that you used in terms of making that trade? I mean, focusing on, on the picks and what we were giving up and the compensation for making a move like that was a big part of our study. Julio Jones aside, we did the same thing as we did with, with Matt Ryan as far as analyzing biomechanically and comparing, it, comparing Julio Jones with all the numbers that we had from a biomechanical assessment to other top-notch receivers in the league, which I thought is, to me, I think that's fascinating, beyond fascinating, to, you know, his strengths, his power output, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and then we were very focused on, again, compensation, and, and we studied in depth we studied in depth the, uh, you know, where, where those picks were actually going and how they were producing. That was big for us. So in a, in a nutshell, it was unprecedented. We put a lot, of, uh, a lot of picks into acquiring what we deemed as one of the top-notch you know, receivers to be for many years to come that we really believe that he, he is definitely an all-pro. 
that he has a, the possibility of being one of those guys down the line that's stepping up on the big stage in the yellow jacket. In time, we'll, you know, we understand time will tell. One of the things that was really interesting in that study was that we realized we knew we were going to have to give away a first and a second round for something like that. A monumental move like that, you're not getting away with, with just a pittance. We know that. It, what really added to the bulk of that trade was the two fourth rounders in our mind. We understood the second rounder was going to be tough to swallow, but we were going to have to swallow it. The two fourth rounders were interesting. And in our minds, as we, we jumped back into the study on it and the, the statistical um, analysis of it really stated to us that less than 50% of those fourth rounders were, were, um, were even active and less than 14% were starters. So um, in, our, in our minds, you're talking about something that was rare as far as an impact type of player for a guy like Julio Jones that we felt was going to be you know, a big-time uh, big impact type player. So that was important for us. That was a really important part of our study uh, to make a decision. Now, in the end, we have to look across at Arthur Blank, and we, we knew that we were going to take a lot of heat for that move. You know, it was an organizational move. It was a decision that, obviously, something like that, your owner had to be on, and, and Arthur was on, on board with that move. And, and in the end, uh, I'm the only guy that takes heat in the, in, in the papers on that. Guys like you are killing me, oh. but, but uh, you know, it all, it, it, in the end, hopefully everything works out, and, and I, we understand how that is, and, and uh, we're... Again, the study of it helped us make a very sound and strong and difficult decision. For those who might not remember, it was they were moving up from like the mid-20s in the first round up to number six, gave up a number one pick the next year, plus a two, two. and two fours. Yeah. So that's, that's a big price to pay. But as you said, Julio Jones has been a big difference maker. And I, I would argue, uh, knowing what we know now, Matt Ryan, Julio Jones were successful decisions. Uh, but as we know, not every decision is a success, even for uh, the best in the business. So how do the decisions that aren't successful challenge you, Mike, I'll lead with you, to stay disciplined you know, in your philosophy and approach? Well, you have to be able to improvise and adjust in your decision-making process uh, as a leader, uh, not just in, in, in football, uh, in running a football team. Uh, there are so many factors that come into play uh, why a decision didn't work out. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's injury, uh, s sometimes it's a personal, a personal matter. We all see it. These are human beings that we're, that we're working with and dealing with. Uh, but you have to stay the course. I think philosophically, uh, our, from the very beginning, we've talked about building through the draft, supplementing through free agency, and that's what we've done uh, for, the, for the six seasons that we've been here. But there are specific situations that are going to arise that you're going to have to change, change course. Uh, and maybe the numbers tell you to, to go one way, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to go uh, a different way. Uh, but you do have to be disciplined because you have a plan and it's a long-term plan and you need to s try to stay that course because you, be you believe in that as a team and as an organization. So to, to, to Smitty's point as well, I think um, one of the things that I'm learning now in my seventh year is the importance of, and Smitty take this the right way, of me studying our coaches as well. I mean, understanding what we have as a staff, how we coach. I think we have a fantastic coaching staff, and they're all individual. They all approach things in a different way. So the idea of bringing in a, a free agent, talking about moves that haven't been successful, and I won't mention names, thinking that that player is going to, you know, is going to make a big impact on our defense, for instance, but understanding that that individual and his character, excuse me, his personality may not mix, you know, with a certain position coach is something that really has to be up to me in the end. Smitty and I can talk about it, but I mean, if we're talking about laying down, you know, 15, 20, 30 million dollars on a free agent and the, the match isn't right, I think you're destined for, for failure, and, I, and that's only part of it. And I understand sometimes it will work and other times it won't. But I, what I'm learning more and more now is to be a lot more, um, you know, have a lot more foresight and a lot more discussion with Smitty, you know, our, our head coach, as well as our coordinators, and sometimes to a point of talking with our, with our position coaches to really decide if this is going to be the right fit. You can even go back as far, and one of the things that I find intriguing is going back as far as trying to determine you know, the history of, you know, Mike Smith's defenses. 
Are we producing in a certain area? Have we? Is that is is a you know is a defensive end the right move for us to make draft free agency to and expect you know 15, 20 sacks? And and if 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 the defense isn't set up that way and it's more set up for pressures and more set up you know for for you know other intricacies in a defense, then we have to make the decision if, if that is in fact the right investment. I think that's really, really fascinating. I think in my early years, I, I didn't have the, again, I didn't have the vision that way. And I think now, seven years in, though not 20 years, I think I'm, I'm gonna be a lot more mindful of that going forward. You know, we're, we're speaking of challenges here, and I know, you know, 2013 uh, wasn't uh, a season that reached the standard that you guys had in your first uh, five. Uh, how challenging was that for you, Thomas? And, and as we sit here today, um, just sort of reflecting back on that and trying to get the things turned around to where they were. Uh, well, I've, I've been pretty open about this. I mean, 13 and 3 is nice, and we had some great seasons. And, you know, uh, I'm going to brag on Smitty again, but I mean, the fact that Mike Smith prior to this year was, you know, he was second to Bill Belichick in wins over the last five years. I mean, that's an incredible record. We, we this coaching staff and Smitty, they, they have not forgotten how to coach. I mean, this is a, this is a top-notch staff, and, and Mike leads, leads the charge with it all. Um, and yet, at 13-3, and three, one of the things that I, I've realized is you don't want to change when you're 13-3. and three. Um, You know, Mr. Blank's not going to change and start doling out money at 13-3 and three because if you're 13-3, and three, man, you've, you've figured it, you know, you're figuring it out, and why add more to the plate? Stay the course, that, that's a common phrase. I love that phrase when it refers to values, uh, not necessarily in the, uh, from the standpoint of staying the course you know, when you start to lose. Sometimes I think it's important for, you know, Smitty uses the, the word, you know, he's referring to calibration and, and changing. That's a very important part. For us, 13 and three, you're staying the course, so to speak. At four and 12, what I found is what I was referring to as productive vulnerability. It's when you truly look at everything truly stand in front of the mirror and strip yourself down and say, look, we need to change a lot. Starting with myself and Smitty at the top, it's one of the discussions we had a lot. Uh, he, uh, Smitty and I talked a lot about it, but we talked to our owner about it, the three of us. You want to talk about being taken to the woodshed. I mean, that's why it makes it that much easier when we go out to some of the, you know, some of the direct reports that we have or, you know, and or the, the director roles, and we're not that hesitant about you know, pressing them because, believe me, we've been pressed in our own way respectfully to everyone. That's, that's our responsibility. So the productive vulnerability side of it all is something that I felt, found really intriguing because I mentioned earlier, and then I'll throw it over to Smitty, positive and uh, passionate. We've dealt with that over the, the years in my mind. We have not had to deal with the persevering side of this organization. And at 4 and 12, you really test yourself on that uh, at that level as well. Same question, Mike, and because I think um, you were the first Falcons coach to actually have back-to-back -back winning seasons, if I remember that correctly, in 2008, 2009. So it hadn't, you know, reached that level. So um, how challenging was it for you? Well, it's challenging when you're not successful and you're always looking for answers, uh, you know, as as a coach to what you can do different. And I think we've done a very nice job uh, as an organization analyzing what we need to do differently uh, and you have to make changes and you don't just make changes for changes sake but you have to take a good hard look at it uh, and you have to take in information from everyone uh, I think it's important that uh, our players are part of are part of the process uh, how we can do things uh, differently and a lot of it uh, as a coach you look at how can we present it how can we present this to the to the players differently uh, and there's technology available that we can do things differently and uh, that's something that uh, was the feedback that I got from some of our some of our players uh, in the way that we pre present the information uh, you know the days of the playbook and a piece of paper to keep a notebook though you know those are going away very, very quickly. Uh, you don't need to have a thousand notebooks in your in your building. Uh, you have the technology. Guys are so more efficient moving around a device, an electronic device, that they can get the information that they need. Uh, the cut-ups, uh, I'm going to get going off on football, but the cut-ups 
are you can actually create your own cut-ups now, our, and we weren't allowing our players to, to do that because they may want to analyze it somewhat differently. They may not want to look at it as all the third downs together. They may want to look at it in some different way, and there's so many ways. It's a simple, it's a simple spreadsheet in, in, in sort, but believe it or not, even guys that are not probably trained to, to use it because that's what the world that they've grown up in. They've grown up in the Excel, the PowerPoint uh, world. You know, I can speak to my, you know, my daughter who's in eighth grade. She gives PowerPoint presentations. They make, you know, so they don't have books. They have a computer at her school. There's no books. So those are things that we're looking at as a coaching staff in terms of how instead of us getting up front of the board and presenting it, using the technology, using the information that we have. We take one play and put 250 plus characters on that one play and each, thing, each character means something to that specific play and now a player can use his mind and how he wants to evaluate and look at it. So we're, get, we're, we're also looking at is the theory of teaching and you know you always wanted to teach to the lowest common denominator we feel like what we need to, what we need to do differently is we've got to have guys at different stages of their development and the coaching staff has to do that because we're going to hold back our players uh if we keep if we continue to coach to the lowest uh denominator so as you were saying that, I was feeling very old school here with my, with my <laughs> note cards, you know, like I should have an iPad yeah, yeah. and like a bunch of different things around me. So, yes. Well, I mean, to that point, I mean, the other thing that I think needs to be uh, discussed, at 4 and 12, again, we talk about, okay, let's, let's open it up and try to decide where we've gone awry and what needs to be fixed. The other thing that our league is doing right now, we're in a, an incredible crossroads, I believe, where we are with technology and, and where we are with cognitive training, which is a whole other topic of conversations, which I'm incredibly fascinated by. You think about that. You, you think about cognitive training. You guys all have had an opportunity to be around the player tracking discussion today. I mean, the league is firmly entrenched in that. We've been involved with that over the last four plus years and what we're determining about the readiness of players. Uh, Smitty is very mindful of our players and how we track them in practices from a heart rate monitor standpoint and a GPS tracking standpoint and again how we're going to utilize those players and who we're going to draw back at times and who you know it's, it's not dictating Mike's practices but it's allowing us to to hopefully keep our players as healthy as possible and so that a guy like Julio Jones won't go down. Again, the technology right now, where we're going with, with um, all of these you know, different approaches, has, has, honestly has a lot to do with our generation. And the fact that Gen Y is firmly entrenched in, you know, in our workforce is, is a very important part of, of you know, our evolution as a league. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. I, I yeah. Wanna, oh, absolutely, yeah. Mike, and, and I'll uh, grab you know, the, the, young, the question. The, the young people, the younger, the, the quote, we you say entry-level coaches and all that, uh, have some, you know, have some wonderful skills, and their skill set is such that I think they they will enhance the learning curve uh, for you know for our players. So not only for us in terms of tracking uh, and and being able to make sure that we have the proper workload, I really believe that technology is uh, you know is going to continue to explode. Uh, our players spend more time. Uh, interacting with you know with a technological tech some type piece of technology piece probably uh, in the last two years is it, it's exploded I mean you see it completely differently when you walk walk through the locker room and I agree with Thomas it is the generation that uh, that we're, that is coming up and integrating into the workplace whether it's football whether it's accounting uh, it's the wave of the of the future. There's there's absolutely no doubt about it. And it's not only pre-acquisition when we're going out trying to decide whether we pull these players in, Matt Ryan back then, Julio Jones. It's also post-acquisition, and that's something that I'm really in, in, in interested in as far as our studies. You know, we get our guys in 
you know, in our camp and, and, you know, they're young guys. We need to continue to keep them healthy so that we can parlay this into another contract and be successful for two and three contracts. And by using, utilizing the technology that's out there today, it's going to help us make some very firm decisions, sound decisions as far as keeping them healthy, but also deciding about a big time contract to make sure that we know that they're going to get the years that we expect out of them. I want to make sure we leave some time for audience questions so I can grab those. And, and while they're coming up, Thomas, I, I did want to ask you, um, do you have someone in the organization that's specifically responsible for analytics and, and how is that integrated? Yeah, I, I want to take this opportunity to uh, introduce uh, Carl Pierberg. So any of the, the uh, resumes go right to Carl. <laughs> um, Carl, all seriousness, he's a fantastic uh, He's fantastic in so many, so many, at so many levels. His intelligence level, his technology understanding. Uh, he's the one that's heading up our, our analytics department right now. And honestly, he's coming up with a lot of really interesting uh, new ways of working, you know, working analytics, but also trying to put together the right program for us, um, whether it is, again, in a situation that's much more um, intern, sort of interactive intern-like, uh, um, but again, we're working on some really interesting things right now, and, and Carl is heading it up, and I'm, we're very proud to have a guy like that who has a really good understanding of technology, statistics, and analytics, as well as a, a fantastic understanding of, of you know, the, 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 our computer programs, and we're doing some fantastic stuff. So kudos to Carl for everything he does for, for Smitty and myself. Good Absolutely. Stuff. MVP. Yeah. <laughs> I'll grab these questions here. Thank you, Brad. All right. See. So I'll start. Let's see with uh, Thomas. Do you leverage from other industries to make football analytics better? We do. We have we have some very uh, interesting uh, relationships with with basketball right now. I think that's probably one of the the very interesting and, and cutting edge sports in my mind. Some of the people that I'm dealing with there regularly, and and to be able. I think everyone probably understands this, to be able to interact with general managers in other sports, uh, you know, that, that feels comfortable. It feels like you're not giving away your, your secrets necessarily. The way that, you know, social media is today, I mean, you can't keep secrets away. We understand that. We just recently um, landed a deal with, with Sparta Sports Science as our sports scientist recently, and I went round and round about the idea of whether we should, you know, get that information out and, and actually, uh, you know, send out a presser on, you know, a press release on it. And in the end, I realized we might as well, because before you know it, within the next 10 days, it's going to get out anyway. So we might as well benefit, you know, from, from that. But the leveraging definitely happens in this league. I know Mike has a lot of very, very good uh, relationships throughout professional sport as well. Mike, th this looks like a good one for you. It, it, it says, it seems like the majority of Falcons analytics is rooted in salary cap, bargain players, et cetera. How much on actual football, which I, I assume... Oh, is gosh. Uh, everything that we do uh, is based on the breaking down of a specific play in a game. Uh, and we have programs that are written for us that uh, are very in-depth. Not to give away s secrets, but you, you, we use analytics each and every year to set our practice plan, we know specifically how many game, how many plays are going to be in a game, how many first and tens, first and series, first and or third and four to fives, third and three to two to threes, third and ones, and we use that those numbers to structure our practices. Uh, and you know, this year we're going to the no huddle. The games, you know, the, the numbers have changed, but historically the numbers are the same. Uh, statistically, so we use it quite a bit uh, in our game planning. Uh, you know, we look at not only down and distance uh, uh, statistics, but we want to know: Are we ahead? Are we behind? If it's a seven-point lead, if it's a three-point behind situation, which direction the wind's going? If it's an outdoor game, what the temperature? You know, what the temperature is. We have, uh, you know, we'll look at plays that they run when the temperature's on, you know, under 40 degrees. Because believe it or not, people have different philosophies and what they'll do in a cold weather game to a, to a warm weather game. So we use it quite a bit, and uh, we can't, you know, we can't get enough of it. Uh, and our players want, you know, want to do it. But I will say this: at the core, you use those numbers 
but a human being is going to have to go out there and, you know, and, ex and execute it. But it is a big, big part of the process of, of what we do. And this sort of actually is a perfect follow-up. Um, even though you use stats and data, Thomas, uh, how important is gut instinct in your decision-making process? And I guess you could probably both answer that, you know, but just from a different perspective. Maybe you from a player acquisition standpoint, Mike from you know, an in-game decision-making standpoint. Right. I mean, we, we all know the gut instinct is, is very important. We, we've spent a lot of years developing this pool of players to compare to from a, an acquisition standpoint. And uh, there's no question that, that we feel like through our experiences we're going to make the right decisions. However, we've gotten to a spot which I'm, you know, again, very excited about. And you see it. I mean, we, I think there are over 20 teams that are attending this conference. I mean, we understand the importance of, of analytics and, and analysis. And so what I, I've talked a lot about, Smitty, I'm not talking about putting you out of work, but... I often think about the next wave of head coaches in this league and what, you know, in the next 15 or 20 years, what those head coaches are going to be like and how, what, what is going to be the model of the, you know, the top-notch head coach. And I believe Smitty would agree with me. It's that guy, that person who comes to the table with, you know, all the incredible leadership abilities that Smitty has and the approach and understanding of football and also is really uh, deeply steeped and, and deeply involved with with analysis and understands how that can help him at so many levels. So I think it's a combination of being comfortable and understanding that it's not same old, same old. We haven't been coaching this way for 30 plus years. I think there's going to be a wave, you know, again, over the next 10 or 15 years of, of a really open-minded, uh, you know, head coaching group that's going to be understanding of abilities, but also utilizing, seriously utilizing, you know, the, the magic of, of numbers, basically. Yeah gut instinct and decision making versus the, uh, the well, use I, of the data? You, you use the numbers. I mean, as coaches, you, you talk about here's their tendencies. Mm -hmm. This is what a team does uh, in this situation, run pass uh, ratios and, and, and such. And you try to get your players to be in tune with that. But you also have to understand and realize that you're analyzing yourself and you're going to always want to change your statistics and that becomes the chess match between the quarterback and the defensive coordinator or the or the coach that you know that comes out uh, so it ultimately ends up being a gut decision I do want to say one of the technologies that I think is uh, becoming more and more prevalent is is that we're you know we're monitoring where guys are lining up on the field you know we we analyze plays and efficiencies and such I think that you know the next wave is going to be the spacing the game is becoming more spread out we're not lined up in traditional positions and there are going to be people that will be, be able to give us concrete information that if we know that this guy's a 4-4 uh, X receiver and he's lined up on the outside of the number you know it's going to take him this long to get to the point A and then to point B, and so we need to make our have our four six guy line up <laughs> at this depth instead of that depth. Right now, we you know we do it in our heads and we do it through experiences. But I really believe the technology is out there with the plotting on the field that that's something that's going to happen as we move forward. And I'll say, Thomas, 10, 15 years from now. I believe you. There's going to be all kinds of good, but I'm not going to be coaching in 10 to 15 years. You're going to be up in Tennessee, I'm going to be, right? yes. Yeah, so you're going to have to come see me uh, up, you know, up in the hills. But I, I really believe that you see the new wave coaches, the young coaches that are coming in, how intelligent they are and how tech savvy they are mm. and how they can create so much information that's so valuable for a coach in the decision-making process from Monday to Saturday to prepare you for that game on Sunday. So uh, we've reached a two-minute warning, so we'll take a TV time out here. Everyone can just relax for No, I'm just joking. <laughs> two-minute warning. I don't, I, here, I'll give you the red flag. <laughs> I can't go. throw it in the last <laughs> two minutes. <laughs> the uh, final question, and it brings us full circle here, because uh, this panel was about alignment between the front office and the field how you build it together. Uh, final question, alignment is great, but how important is respectful tension and diversity of ideas? And we'll wrap up with that. 
You want to go first? Yeah, sure. Uh, as Thomas mentioned uh, mentioned earlier, you've got to, you've got to have disagreements in a relationship. If not, then you're not going to you're not going to move forward, and you're not going to be as efficient as you possibly can. And I think that you have to challenge one another as co-team builders, as Thomas and I like to say, as co-team builders, you have to challenge one another on, an, you know, on, on different points, you know. Uh, and I think, it's, I think it's a healthy thing. I think it's something, though, that has to happen more times than not in a private setting than in a public setting. There's a right time and a right place to have those types of discussions, and we, ha and we have them. I think it's very important to, to Smitty's point as well to eliminate any of the division of states within within the building. You know, coach forever there there has been a chasm between, you know, coaching and personnel or, you know, that's we've had a lot of discussions about that. We understand how incredibly important it is, you know, again, back to the earlier point of making sure that we are we're we're riding the same rail. And that's going to be important. It's going to be important not to be defensive so that when Smitty comes to me, he should be able to come to me on everything, which he does, to be able to talk to me about anything within the entire football operations, anything that is irking him, anything that is a concern for him, as I should with him. That's, that's where the relationship really thrives in my mind. When you have a, a, um, a disconnect there and there are, there are worries about doing that for one reason or another or concerns, then I don't think you're getting the, you know, you know, the full, you know, full amount of information that you need to create that winning organization. So we've reached the, uh, the end time here. Thank you to Thomas. Thank you to Mike. Thanks for everyone for being here. Thank you. Thank you.